So sure about what, Dad? About Carson. He doesn't stack up. To what? As a suspect. Don't put avocado on the burger. What? Simple is always best. Look, Carson killed Jordan and Atlanta. Then those two degenerates at Crazy Betty's Motel. Hell, he even tried to kill you, didn't he? Have you forgotten that? But Carson was a coke dealer. Why would he want to kill his clients? And what would be his motive for killing Alana and Jordan and the Moorwood girl? It doesn't make sense, sir. I'm sorry. There you go again. Now you're piling hummus on top of the burger, too. What if he was punishing them? He knew Alana was cheating on her husband. He knew that Frank and Goldie were making porn. And who would know all that? Someone they knew. Someone they trusted. You mean like a drug dealer? Sir, a drug dealer with morals? Come on. All right, I read Brenda's magazine. Christmas, the number one holiday for people going nuts. That's motive enough for me. This podcast is not safe for work and will feature movie spoilers. It will feature scenes described of a graphic nature. It will contain language which most listeners may find offensive. Welcome to the podcast Under the Stairs. Welcome back to another instalment of Silent Night in Pieces, where we take beloved classic remake Silent Night from 2012. We chop it into five minute reviewable segments for podcasts under the stairs. I get co hosts from around the globe to join me on those five minutes, and then I take the order which is sensible and logical and linear, and I throw that out the window, and then I just at random pick the episodes that are going to be released. This episode here is going to be covering minutes 50 through 55 of the movie. And joining me is an incredible tour de force of podcasting awesomeness. It is one Mr. Doug Tilly. How's it going, Doug? Ho, ho! Hello, Duncan. How are you? (laughs) Oh, no. This is a bad idea. (laughs) It is a bad idea. But here we are. I think, by the way, we're recording this very late into the number of people who are doing these segments. So I think it's a little late to turn back at this point. It is too late to turn back, but I mean, the, it's a guilty pleasure for me, right? This movie fails in so many ways, but delivers so much entertainment. It's, de- like, it's like a horrible, horrible, horrible act that you just can't take your eyes off of. Um, and it continues all the way through. Uh, and this, I can't believe for one second, was your first time viewing said movie. Was it? <laughs> It was. Now, oh, long-time listeners of the podcast Under the Stairs, but specifically when I've appeared on your podcast, might know that I'm not a big um, slasher guy. Mm. I just, I'm just i just not a huge fan of slasher movies generally. And I do have a kind of a little bit more affection for the kind of um, revisionist type slasher films. Yeah. Ones that are, you know, and even, you know, and it, it feels like this came sort of in the wake of like Hatchet movies that are kind of throwbacks to a certain extent. Yep. Um, and this, uh, and so I went into this with optimism and it's got a hell of a cast. I mean, I know this yeah, is probably yeah. something that's been said a, a dozen times. It's not like I listened to your podcast. <laughs> but, um, it's probably been said a ton of times, but like, how, how did they get this cast? <laughs> what I what are they doing? <laughs> no idea. Well, I, you've got to think that Malcolm McDowell off of doing the Halloween movies was just like, like people were like, we could get Mc, McDowell as our new presence. You, you know, we can get him in our horror movie. He's our new horror. You know what Malcolm McDowell is doing currently? Well, maybe not this very second, but over the last year or so? I don't know. He plays a supporting role on a Newfoundland set and filmed sitcom. What? <laughs> yes, this is so, this is absolutely true. He plays, there's a, I'm, I'm going to go into it a little bit because I'm from Newfoundland, but mm-hmm. there's a comedian in, in Newfoundland called named Mark Critch. He's uh-huh. on a, a show called This Hour is 22 Minutes, and he released a memoir a few years ago called Son of a Critch, which they turned into a sitcom, and Malcolm McDowell plays his grandfather uh, because it's about a younger version of himself on the show. <laughs> so that's how he ends up in things like Silent Night, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, it's such a... It's such a... 
he's such a good actor as well, and it's kind of it's kind of awesome. I kind of awesome just clearly not taking direction in this, this movie. He's decided that he is 100% fully American curmudgeon cop um, and like no one has had the heart to say maybe just tighten up the... I don't, I've never understood this about American movies with the need to... Like some British actors are really good at American accents. Like James yes. McAvoy is great in an American accent. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. Like, I tell you who's not Sean Connery. I will tell you who's not like Gerard Butler. I'm, I'm naming a lot of Scottish people here, but like, yeah, there are certain people like Anthony Hopkins does not do a great like American accent. It's okay, but it's not great. You know, under scrutiny, it kind of falls apart. Or long lines of dialogue, it kind of falls apart. Like whoever wrote this script and kept putting the word bloody, the most English of all swear words. Of um, course. In here is basically crippling McDowell every time he says it because he's he can't help himself. He's like, We're gonna get to the bottom of this bloody mess, you know. Like, every time <laughs> his accent just slips in, and you're like, Oh no, what are we doing? Um, but yeah, even um, what's his face, uh, Donald, uh, in this one is fucking great as like Jim Epstein, the oh, like, Donald Lowe, yeah, he's yeah, terrific. He's I mean, he's a great actor, incredible. <laughs> so good in this movie so yeah i actually think the acting all the way through is is actually good like really strong for it's the this kind of movie that's pretty awful How and the mean? story <laughs> and the story the story's pretty bad as well and some of the filmmaking and the editing's not very tight and you know now that i think about it the cinematography is a little <laughs> well, well, i'm just joking I, the... I know so this was my first time watching it as yeah. i said sorry i'm gonna step right on top of do it and i'm just gonna say i did enjoy myself watching it i'm not knocking it whatsoever yeah. but it is very odd that it even exists it's a very very strange movie and it feels like it just happened at an exact moment where you could get this level of talent and it was a filmmaker who was coming off of a few kind of smaller successes and he really wanted to do this particular material Mm -hmm. and he went out and did it and boy i'll tell you the one thing that i really resonates with this movie is that somehow it feels really canadian without being canadian (laughs) because it was very clearly filmed in canada (laughs) well the thing is it's i mean this is the this is the kind of house of wax sort of remake effect where we really Mm. only copy one or two elements from the original and then just make a completely different movie and i've said this many times at its core i love the premise of this movie like, there's a Santa Con happening on a town. A serial killer's mm-hmm. shown up dressed like Santa Claus. Like that, he's, although this movie does a terrible job of paying this off, he's essentially punishing those that have sinned in the town um, uh-huh. by sending them lumps of coal. I mean, it's like all of it on paper is great. It is just handled so poorly. And none of these things, like the, the coal element, is never really explained. They're really, like, sold up in any way, shape, or form, or great fashion. He kills people that aren't on the naughty list. Um, yeah. Like, just all this stuff. And then there's a germ of an idea of this being a, like, travelling Santa killer who is essentially <laughs> returning home, which is paid off in no way, shape, or form. And at the reveal of the end of the movie, you reveal it's a character you've never seen before. So, I mean... <laughs> I, I just like, it's like, oh... Finally, the big reveal. There's been a lot of like, uh, you know, it, 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 there's been a few red herrings all the way through. Who's the killer? He's just some guy. Remember some that guy? Yeah, <laughs> just just some dude who who is driving a chimney repair van called Santa. You know what I mean? But it's so it's so good. It's so entertaining. It's it's a car crash of a movie. You landed minutes fifty through fifty five. This starts with our deputy chatting to. Like red herring number one, Stieg uh-huh. Carson, the giant, apparently date rapist who like <laughs> who just like leans into a- a- AKA Mister Snow, um, and this will end with uh, the deputy basically on the phone to her dad, who also dresses up like Santa in this movie, who also was the cop that killed the serial killer's dad. You would have thought that would have played a. You're just giving away all the secrets in this one. <laughs> I like. I mean, I, like, I, but I feel like I need to lean into that because I have recorded yeah. with a few people who did not pick up on that. What? It's the end of the movie. Yeah, like, but they, show, the movie, they go. Like, they do a zoom in yeah. on his fucking badge yeah. that says his name. Yeah, they didn't get. Him. So I kind of feel like I have to lean it a little bit harder just so the listeners pick up on the fact that I'm smart and pick that up. Um, but yeah, she's on the phone to him. Let's, let's, there's a lot of dialogue here, right? Yeah. Some primo, primo 
Christmas hate and dialogue, Doug. It, it warms my cockles. Um, so this starts with the deputy already interrogating one Mr. Stig Carson, double, uh, double S, uh, and his name, double S my ass. Um, and uh, she's like, um, about a uh, Mr. Snow. <laughs> and Carson's like, nope. She's like, do you have any plans for tonight, for Christmas? And this is like, this is ballsy. Because, like, like I said before, this is like, a, I don't know if this is a felony. Feels like a fucking felony. It's like, I'm going to spread as much joy, as many parcels of happiness as I can. Well, so, so far what he's saying, that seems okay, right? Spreading yeah, he is, he's doing it in a menacing tone, though. No. <laughs> like, <it's> like, <laughs> his tone does not denote someone who is, you know, excited to spread as much cheer. And he says, it's the next part that's kind of a problem. Yeah, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> 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 Um, I don't think this was okay in 2012. And he says, then I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna get my girlfriend so wasted that she won't know if I fuck her in the ass. And the deputy's response oh. is, you don't seem very happy about Christmas, do you? <laughs> She's just yada 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 and right over this. And then we get I mean I'll I'll Robert. tell you, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you for a second, Duncan, just to say that, that maybe the thing that's most commonly complained about in regards to this movie is that it's very mean spirited. Oh, gosh. And yes. it really is. It's except, and maybe that's the thing, that's both the thing that I kind of respected about it because it was just willing to be very mean, even yeah. though there's not, there's no uh, lack of movies, particularly horror movies, that have a mean streak. But it's just mean for no reason. Like, how could they be so surprised that these crimes are happening in this town where everyone seems awful and miserable? The police, the, 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 the police sheriff, Malcolm McDowell, says at one point in this movie, porn, drugs, when the, when did this town become so sleazy? And you're like, you're the fucking sheriff. Like, <laughs> like, you're moaning about parking tickets and cats up trees. Yeah, on your watch, there's an underground porn like scene here. There's full on rampant drugs running rife. This is on your watch, Sheriff. This is on your watch, McDill. Come on, get the finger out. Uh, yeah, that like everyone hates Christmas in this movie. Um, Carson says, Let me tell you about Christmas. Ain't all candy canes and pretty lights. Christmas can fuck you up. I heard this story. This fella was pissed that his wife left him on account of him being a dull man. She took up with a more exciting fellow. This is the same guy that's talking about, like, date raping, and he's all of a sudden become, like, you know, let me tell you a little story here, she. Um, he's like, he went to the party that we were all, and he went dressed as Santa. He took, he took with him a weapon, one that he made with his own hands. His own hands. His own hands. So it's like a, like a, like a stick. Um... <laughs> I don't know. If this is the same dude that they like we saw like he fashioned himself a homemade flamethrower. This guy is like clearly the fifth member of the A team that we never met. Um it's like face, Hannibal, Murtock, Mr. T, Santa. Um dude, I'm dude, sure, I'm still more politically aligned with this guy than Dwight Schultz, I can tell you. That. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, they set about the killing. Um them and all <laughs> them. That was naughty. He all of a sudden like becomes like a listen here, Gavna. By the way, this dude, this dude, who, the actor who plays it, I think his name is Mike O'Brien. He yeah. passed away unfortunately a few years ago. But he's, I mean, look, I can, I can at this point spot a Canadian accent from a mile away. <laughs> this is Mister Canada here with his killing them. That was so. I mean, no, it's just like, he's Canada's Michael Benman, isn't he? Really? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, <laughs> like, but without like you know like the, the skin afflictions that poor Mister Benman has. This guy just mm. looks like he's had he looks like he's been out in the snow forever. Um, he's partly like he worked in. Yeah, he's Canadian. I already told you. That. Yeah, <laughs> <It's> all, <laughs> Duncan. <laughs> Uh, he goes, uh, uh, the wife's boyfriend ran, left her behind. She begged for forgiveness, pleaded for her life. He had no mercy for sinners. For sinners. Burnt the Malta crisp with his homemade fashion flamethrower. Um, most people would just get like get, like a can of hairspray and a lighter. Not this guy. He fashioned the real thing. Um, and he's still doing it too. Every year, a new town. And I'm like, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> the deputy's like, everyone knows that story. And I'm like, do they? Yet this is the first time it's come up in a movie about a Santa killer. Like, this is the first I have time a, it's come I, up. I have so many questions about this. <laughs> like, you're telling me that no, if this is happening, like, regularly in different towns, yeah. in the era of social media, right? This movie takes place in 2012, yeah. Yeah, in 2012, the year that it was actually made. And people are not talking about a flamethrower Santa Claus killer <laughs> who's going from town to town <laughs> yearly. I also have some issues with the age element of it because we are shown 
Anyway, yes. I mean, I, that's that's for someone else to talk about, but I'm not sure that the timelines really oh, work God, out. Oh, no, God, no. Also, right, if this happened in this town, right, mm -hmm. which we're led to believe it did with a flashback, unless our dad moved town, which is possible, right? If this happened in this town, right, no one knows about it. You know what I mean? Like, the sheriff well, doesn't know about this case that happened in his lifetime that yeah. involved a man going absolutely fucking berserk because how old is Jamie King's character supposed to be, you think? Maybe maybe 40 at the latest, but probably in like her 30s, right? I would have thought 30s, yeah. I would have thought and 30s. You she's a deputy she... as well, you know what I mean? So she's a deputy, so you would assume 30s. And she witnessed it, which is another weird thing for her to say that it's an urban legend because she's yeah. there. We yeah. see her at the end. So it had to have been... Like, it's not like Malcolm McDowell would have just been starting. He probably would have been in the meat of his, like, he'd be in his 40s. Yeah, like, who, who, who shows up at a precinct and doesn't get handed the, you know, the cold case on the, like, or, or the, like, you know when you go into a small town, these are the worst crimes that have ever happened to you. Because that's how you yeah. benchmark your success as a sheriff. Well, we've not had another flaming Santa. You know what I mean? Like, that's how you benchmark this. He has not a fucking... Like, no one knows. And the dad is telling no one except, like, later on in a wry conversation where he's like, that won't be the first time a Brad and Morris had to take down Santa. And you're like, there's been another one? Maybe you should go into details about that, dad. <laughs> right. Anyway, the deputy's like, everyone knows that story. It's an urban legend. Carson says, ain't... Have you been a naughty girl, deputy? And I'm like, why is this movie so fucking leery? Oh, just yeah, so leery. And the deputy's like, oh, really? So she gets her mobile phone out. We're like, what's she doing? She dials up Mr. Snow and Carson's phone rings. Wouldn't you know it? And he's like, who put you on to me? Was it Frank? That creep? I love this. Frank the porn producer. Uh -huh. He's the creep. That kid Dennis, you know, who was obviously a creep because he robbed from his granddad. And yep. he's the guy who just, he's the drug dealer who wants to rape his his girlfriend. Um, and the deputy's like, just stay calm. And Carson is like looking about. And then he does, the two times in this movie, he does a really bad Buffalo Bill, where he kind of like <laughs> fakes and then leans off to the, the to the right. And he runs out. And then I love this. <laughs> the deputy's on the radio. She's like, Carson is Mr. Snow. I repeat, <laughs> Carson's Mr. Snow. So she chases after him. And she, she basically ends up in an alleyway. She didn't check her blind spot. This deputy is a rookie. And uh, Carson jumps her. And then, like, is all but... Like, it's not like I'm going to hit her and then run away. He's like, I'm just going to murder this cop to add to my list of dealing drug crimes. This really escalated quickly. <laughs> sure, that, you know that war on drugs is really, it's really backfiring. Um, in small town Winnipeg. <laughs> yeah, well, in small town <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> the police arrive Carson makes a run for it um, Sheriff comes running out with a big battle the bass line in this is not quite scream if you know what I mean bow do do <laughs> like, like, you're like what are we, what are we doing here um, and the sheriff's like I you hurt and she's like no now, where do you think he went like I love that where do you think he went well, if I knew that, we'd be going there right now to arrest him. And she's like, Where is the dialogue here is amazing. I know. Wherever he feels safe. Wherever, what are you saying? Wherever lady? he feels safe. And then the sheriff's like that. Well, I'm on his trail now. There's nowhere safe. <laughs> You're fucking right. Malcolm McDowell. I'm sure you've had this discussion already. Is Malcolm McDowell trying to do an American accent? Because yes. like, it's so weird. Yeah. Because he's definitely trying to do American dialogue outside of the use of the word bloody, which is, you're right, consistent throughout. Yeah. But sometimes it's just like, it's not even a little bit of an attempt. And no. also, Malcolm <laughs> McDowell has, like, the greatest voice maybe ever. Just like, he has make him an great... Englishman that's moved to America. I don't understand the difficulty here. <laughs> do, do what movies sometimes do when they can't fi figure this shit out. Just make him Irish. Yes. Right? Just say he's an Irish cop. It's, they're... <laughs> an Irish and then, then it's just... cop. Yeah, and I mean, he doesn't need to speak with an Irish accent, though I'm sure he yeah. would love to make, give that a try. <laughs> but I mean, then, then you can get away with just about anything. He, yeah. Oh, he talks funny. Yeah, you know, family from Ireland. Yeah, like, I, you know, I don't, you could I even don't do that, that as a, like, a transfer thing and say, well, that's why he wasn't around for <laughs> well, <laughs> Flame he's Thor. Like, he is, like, because he, he, he try like, you know, he, but the dialogue never sits comfortably. So when he's like, sorry, no. ass, you're like, right, kind of American. But then later on, he's going to say, don't you tell me how to suss out a perp. 
<laughs> that like, is my favorite line in the entire movie. <laughs> Don't tell me how to suss out a perp read by Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> Which you know for a fact he was like that. Is a is a letters missing from from the script here. This is P E R P perp. Pep, I don't, I don't think I understand this word here. And they're like, no, it's it, that's the word. And he's like, oh, okay then. Uh, don't you tell me how to suss out a perp. I don't know what it means. Uh, can someone? There's twelve look? takes where he's like, don't tell me how to suss out a perpetrator. <laughs> <laughs> no, you need to shorten it. I can't. I don't know. So it's not a word. Um, it's not in the Oxford Dictionary. Can't do it. Um, you know when I used to act, uh, when I used to do Shakespeare on the the no, you're not no, the other one gets flashbacks. So anyway, he goes like, "There's no." He's way. looking away wistfully. He's like, "I was Caligula. <laughs> I was killing." <laughs> well, the thing is, like my my theory on this one is like he like had a bad year or something or unpaid tax or some shit, and he's like that. I'm gonna do this small indie horror movie, um, and he didn't realise that like it would be mocked mercilessly by podcasters. Moving onwards, um, I love him. I think he's he's so much fun in this movie, and he's like, no, we're safe. And he's kind of looking off to the side. Um, the deputy somehow here, giving the worst performance while also being the highlight of the entire oh, a hundred percent. He is the MVP. Him, yeah. and uh, Jim Epstein in this movie are the, the are legitimately. Like and it, like them and maybe next rung down is the pervy priest who gets his mm. big his big monotone yeah. um, kind of rant. It's not even monotone. He's big evangelical spewing forth about sin whilst at the same time taking pictures of, of women inappropriately and stealing from the collection jar. Um, <laughs> just being just a general <laughs> creep. Um, it's awesome. It's awesome. Well, she's healing herself up. She gets on the phone to her dad, uh, and she's like, uh, "Dad," and he's like, "Hi, princess. I'll get your mum." She's like, no, no, I really need to speak to you. And he's like, oh, what's going on? And you sound upset. Um, she's like, I don't think I'm cut out for this job. And he's like, are you kidding? I spent for- 40 years on the force like, hunting Santas. Um, I know what makes a good cop, Aubrey. And she's like, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I, I can't do it. I mean, maybe before I lost John, which is never explained in this movie. I kind of like that it's not explained. It's because never explained. You kind of get it, right? She, it's like, obviously someone that she was close to, if not her husband or something yeah. like was that. Was he a I cop? Mean, how did she yeah, choke? Right. Did she have a chance to shoot? What happened? Um, also, like the like, getting, oh, McDowell's literally said nothing has happened in this town. But apparently, a cop died last year, like in a gunfight. <laughs> like, but anyway, you know, background noise. Um, she's like, uh, I thought I was brave and intuitive like you, but I'm not. I choked, Dad. I choked, and that is the end of the scene. Uh, Doug, this is just. A tour de force of cinema right here. Do you have a favorite bit? <laughs> oh, right. We're supposed to talk about our favorite bit. Yeah. I mean, look, it, it's hard for me to say that it's my favorite bit. Yeah. And maybe really my favorite is the flashback to the Santa Claus with the flamethrower because you can't really beat that. But we, <laughs> yeah. get, better, we get better Santa Claus flamethrower stuff later. So maybe yes. I can't really say it. But really the vileness of Steen Carson going that he's going to get his girlfriend so wasted yeah. she won't even know if he fucks her in the ass. Yes. I mean, that there is a pleasant poetry to that that is hard to beat, uh, <laughs> even though it is reprehensible in all ways. Um, I, I, just, I just love, like, small diminutive Malcolm McDowell, who will get his get his bit in the next clip we're doing, which we have already played because he orders the order. Um, but him being like that, nowhere safe. We've got to search every in-house, outhouse, barn house, dog house. <laughs> I absolutely love that. It makes me smile endlessly. Uh, Doug Tilly, you're a busy man. You do podcasts and stuff. Where can people check out your stuff? Uh, you can always find my latest episodes of Cinema Smorgasbord, a podcast with a bunch of sub-podcasts devoted to such diverse actors as the career of Jackie Chan, Carol Kane, Alejandro Jodorowsky, uh, George Kennedy, Oliver Reed. Find that over at cinemasmorgasbord.com. We come out every single Monday. And you can find my micro-budget uh, cinema podcast, No Budget Nightmares, still being released uh, occasionally over at nobudgetpodcast.com phenomenal ladies and gents we are doing an episode every single day this month from the 1st through to 24th which means there is an episode coming tomorrow so until then i'll speak to you next time